All right. Welcome back, Burn of Medieval Legions of Metal uh, nice Festival. Um, how are you today? Great, great. Just got done working. So now working on fest stuff the rest of the week. We're trying to get our pre-party all planned and get our the final touches. I got t-shirts getting ordered tonight. And so, yeah, things are all shaping up. And and I'm actually making a, a new thing to sell the fest. Remember the old 80s carnival mirrors? You, you can yes. buy the carnivals. With the, with the, we're making those for the fest also this year. So that'll be something new for people to buy. It seems like a lot of things are happening. Um, yeah. So when did Legions of Metal uh, Festival originate? It's funny because in 2017 was when it started, but it kind of spawned off like, I don't remember Rag and Rocker Metal Apocalypse Fest that was in Chicago here at Reggie's for a couple of years. They had like Riot one year, Tigers of Hang Tang played one year and stuff. Uh, a guy I knew did that show. And I, I actually, I started out, you know, give him a hard time and became friends. And then in 2017, 2012, I went to the pre-party there one night to hang out and I was talking to the guy who ran it and he needed help driving bands around during the day of the show. So I'm like, I could help out driving some bands around. And we just started talking more and more. And he was like, hey, next year, you want to help me out getting bands? Because I have no background in any of this. I was just a fan who goes to shows and and then I started helping him out and talking to him more often and kind of giving him ideas on who to book, who people, you know, bands would want to see. And then that year he was like, hey, I'll give you the second, the joint room stage to book and I'll do the main stage. And then it just grew and grew and grew. And then we were booking for 2017, but he lost over the years. He was like thousands in debt. I think, man, it was a crazy amount. He one day called saying like, he can't do it anymore. He's pulling the plug. He can't lose his house and all this stuff. So he pulled the plug canceled the show it was a huge drama online because he had the show almost all booked and he basically canceled the show didn't tell reggie's didn't tell the bands he deleted the event page and the facebook page and everyone was like what happened and then reggie's got a hold of me asked him what was going on and i said well he canceled the show and they didn't know and all the bands were hitting me up asking what was going on so reggie's were like well you got, got to keep it going so they put me in touch with shane merrill who has been doing shows in Chicago for like 25 years. And we kind of rebuilt from the ashes of that festival. We carried over a few bands who were still wanting to be part of it and stuff. And so in 2017, it's funny because I've been going to Shane's shows for years, never met him in person before. And it was actually the first time he met was getting legions going and stuff. And yeah, and Shane saved the day. He got like Armored Saint and Diamond Head and Ross the Boss and all this stuff. So yeah, so 2017 was when it all started and stuff. So it's kind of weird. It was like going from like zero to hundred miles an hour with like, you know, just kind of doing the small stuff and then suddenly being pulled into the main stuff with, you know, dealing with band managers and all the stuff that, you know, I never dealt with before. So it's kind of interesting. What was the biggest challenge in, in putting it all together? I think mostly a uh, combination of dealing with like egos and then like money. And it's always hard discussing the money part because every band want to play, everyone wants to be part of it. And then when you talk business, that's where you got to put friendships aside <laughs> and being nice aside to go, okay, because you want to, you know, you want to get, you know, everyone wants to make money off it. And it's, it's a very tight budget for these kind of things because you got like, 20 bands coming in and trying to keep the budget low so you can make it affordable and then trying to get the best bang for your buck, I guess, with bands. So that was the hardest struggle was trying to do that. And Shane's been great because he's got so many connections and knows how to do all this stuff. And he's a mastermind with budgeting and finding flights and, you know, doing that. And then, you know, that's the hardest part. And also too, just trying to deal with like the day-to-day -day things. Cause like, People don't realize every day for an hour to two hours, I you know, we work on this. I'll get up and do the social media stuff, change dealing with like managers or like budget stuff, I'm trying to think of ideas. Like this past couple of months from January all the way until a couple of weeks ago, we had a couple of bands drop and it was like every day trying to figure out what to do, 
who would fit in best, who's available, because with you know the COVID stuff still going on, and some bands haven't rehearsed in two or three years, so a lot of bands weren't active. So, yeah, mostly the hard part is just the budgeting part and dealing with that kind of thing. But mostly the business side of things is the hardest part for me, because you, you know it's you become friends with everybody and everyone's you know being nice, and all of a sudden you go, okay, we can only offer this, and then. <laughs> Then everyone's like, well, whoa, well, then it comes, you know, more of that kind of thing. But it's, it's, that's the hardest part for me, I think. It seems like a lot of work goes into it. How many um, editions of the festival have you done so far? We've done three years of the two-day fest. Then we did the October one last year, the one-day show, which worked out really nice because, you know, I have a notebook on my table here where I have, like, all my ideas, future ideas for bands and stuff. and you know, that goes back actually to the last question. One of the hardest things too is trying to keep your lineup different from other festivals. Because now it's like, there's like a million festivals going on and everyone is, in the United States only has a small pool of bands. So you got to always be like finding new things or special reunions. Like the first year, the biggest thing for me that first year we did Legions was my friend Jeremy from Heaven and Hell Records was reissuing the Cerebus uh, album. And he called me and was like, hey, the band's back together again on the first show. So like instantly I got a hold of Shane and was like, Cerebus is back, we gotta get them. No one's had them yet, they'll be a big thing for us. And it worked out great. So every year we try and find someone who's reunited, hasn't played a show yet. Like the second year we did Phantom from New York. Last year we had Overlord SR who's been around for a while, but they really play shows. So we were trying to get one oddball band from the eighties and stuff. and so that's another hard part too, is trying to get that because you have these guys who haven't rehearsed in X amount of years, suddenly now trying to, you know, learn the songs, do a, do a good live show and then get them out here and stuff. But yeah, so uh, that's another, that's another, you know, back to the last question, another like hurdle you have to go through. What was that, what was the question? I, I got sidetracked again. <laughs> uh, the question was how many uh, editions have you done so far? Yeah, we did the three, the three two-day ones, and then during COVID, when things were getting, when shows started coming back again, Shane messaged me saying, "Hey, want to do a one-day show, kind of to kickstart things, get people feeling comfortable again to come back to shows, to you know, get things going again." And I was, you know, already in, like, perfect, let's do it. So I had my notebook, and I'm like, "Well, okay, since we lost two years of the fest with lockdowns." I wanted to get bands that I wanted to get from ideas from the past. So I'm like, okay, so a lot of the bands that you saw on the October show were gonna be on our 2020 show if we were able to do one at the time, but since we did no show. So yeah, we did three, we did basically like three and a half shows we did. So then this May will be our fourth two year one. And then Shane already told me he wants to get going on the next one. So we'll have a fifth edition. So it'll be great. Now, I noticed that you only have U.S. bands feature um, in the festival. Uh, any chance of adding maybe some of the unique overseas bands? See, that's it's interesting. Because, yeah, in Ragnarokker, uh, Mike, the guy who ran it, he bought Wizard over in 2012. And then, like, next year, he bought Oz. And then we did uh, Tigers of Pang Tang the next year. And we kind of did it in a sneaky way because with visas now, for one band, it could cost between twenty five hundred to three thousand per band, and it's also not a guarantee to get in the country. Basically, it depends on the guy at the front at the TSA gate when you come in. If he wants to let you in, you come in. If he finds a reason not to do it, so you could you could spend like five thousand dollars on a band, and they won't come in. So we got burned. We did Battle Axe originally for the first year of our fest we had booked and we bought the airfare and Europe, the, the overseas airfare is not refundable we got. And a week and a half after we booked their flights, one of the guys had a heart attack in the van, they canceled on us. So we lost about like three grand on airfare. <laughs> and then we were to have Crying Manus that same year too, but they had other issues come up and they didn't want to come over then. And then we were like, you know what? This is way too stressful for the overseas bands. There's too many like 
potential issues, but we get like hit up all the time. Like I had Tyson dog hitting me up, uh, Desolation Angels, uh, Tigers of Pink Tanks, the always want to come back. But we had Killer the first year, the first year of the fest from Belgium. And that was actually Kelly, one of our good friends from California. She got like eight friends and they all chipped in and they paid for Killer to come over. That was a huge thing for us. We were, I couldn't believe that, you know, the diehard fans wanted to see him at the show so bad they paid for it. And so that was kind of thing. But then Shane and I were like, you know what? This is way too stressful for these overseas bands. And we started just doing U.S. bands only. And then we had Antichrist on the lineup originally from Sweden, but they were coming to Maryland Death Fest. So they were doing a small tour. So like, okay, this is, this is perfect. We don't got to pay for overseas flights. We, we talk about every year, like it'd be cool to get some overseas bands, but the stress factor is so high. So if you want to do it the right way with, with uh, visas, you know, it's expensive and the risk is, you know, very high still, or you could do it the way we used to do it, where you had the guys come as tourists, but that's a huge risk also. <laughs> like when, uh, when Blades, is, well, when Spring Bash had uh, Evil Invaders come over, and they got, they landed and got caught at the airport for coming over the, uh, to play a show. And they got, one guy got arrested and one guy got, they got basically sent home. They landed at O'Hare Airport and eight hours later on a plane back to Belgium. That seems so, like yeah. a lot of risk. Yeah, um, because now we, because I found out too from Evil Invaders, I found out, I talked to them when I was overseas at a show, I guess they use metal archives now when people come over. The, uh, the border people in the TSA, no metal archives. So now they'll run your name through metal archives to see if you're in a band and then they'll search your name on Google because I guess when Evil Invaders came over, they uh, they had, you know, we, yep, everyone just says don't dress like a rocker. And they kind of stood out, I guess. So they got questions of being in the band. And the guy took his passport and went on Metal Archives and found him and turned the computer around and showed him, here you are. And then typed in his name and band and saw the flyer for the show. And he got busted for it. So, yeah, so now there's, as great as the internet is, it's also could work against you. <laughs> oh, certainly. Um, what were some of your favorite performances at the festivals? My favorite ones for the first year was Cerebus for sure. That was just like, I mean, Scott the singer sounds just like he does in the 80s. And, and it's always risky with like reunion bands because you never know how they're going to sound or be, you know, if they're going to be good on live. And they came out and they were just on fire. It was incredible. That was my favorite from the first year. The second year, Phantom was great. Uh, Q5 is always amazing. TKO, the headliner, was great, I thought. Uh, Halloween we had. Uh, the last the last 2019 one, uh, Liege Lord was amazing. Overlord was great. You know, everyone, we've always been lucky. We haven't had any real clunkers live. One of Shane and I's big thing is, at the end of the day, you want a good lineup, but also you want to have a good live show. You want people to leave the fest going, holy smokes. It was like, there was no like downside or no like, oh, that band stunk or this wasn't good. Even the small, a lot of times with our show, when I book the newer bands for the small stage, a lot of people are always like, oh, I never heard of this band, never heard of this band. And then when they go to the show, I always talk to people after the show what they thought. And they're always like, oh my God, these three bands on the small stage blew away the headliners to me. So it's funny how it will work for them people that, you know, they'll meet, find new bands that way. And, but yeah, those are some of my favorite ones I think I had, for the, you know, and then a lot of the new bands that, I mean, I stored the first year was really good live. Uh, you know, we had Solicitor who was fantastic. Uh, the 2019 year and stuff. And yeah, just so many, it's so hard to keep track. It's crazy. When I started looking back at all the old flyers, like, oh my God, it's like so many great shows, bands we had perform and stuff. Okay. Now we also have Shane with us now. Hello, Shane. How are you? Oh. We're not hearing you. <laughs> how about now? Okay, we're hearing you. Hey, how are you guys. today? Good. How are you guys? All right. Me and Bob had been uh, talking about the fest. Um, how did you get involved um, in, in promoting this festival, Shane? Well, Bob's uh, former partner kind of... <laughs> 
vanished, right, Bob, for the most yeah, part? Yeah, I, mean, I, I kind of gave him the little history of that little thing, too. Yeah, kind of yeah, had and, a breakdown and vanished. And, and you know, Robbie, the owner of Reggie's and I, caught wind of that. And <clears> Robbie <throat> always loved Ragnarokker and didn't want to see it go away. So, you know, Bob and I started talking about let's let's keep it alive somehow. And I think out of respect to um, Odin and everything, we changed the name, but kept the spirit going and that's pretty much how it happened we didn't want to see it go away we thought it was a great event for reggie so that's kind of how i got involved yeah. now we already covered a lot of ground here um what were some of the fun stories behind the scenes uh, oh. at the festival and any, any spinal tap moments <laughs> yeah for sure there's been some spinal tap moments um the one i always come back to is um well there's a couple um there's I would say Overlord has got to be up there. Or <laughs> I was just going to say. You talk about, I mean, I, talk about Spinal Tap. There might be a little bit of that in there. Um, what was the uh, uh, the local the local band that played a couple of years ago and they brought like all their families out and stuff with them? Oh, oh, Red Baron. Yeah. Red Baron. Red Baron. Yeah. That, that was, was great. Was... Yeah. They brought all those guys and they were in shock like savage master was playing and they were like what the heck is this and yeah they were they were a trip they were a trip um uh who's the uh the bass player that was uh a couple years ago he was kind of like um real flashy and oh culprit 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 yes yes uh the uh nothing against those bands but those three those three bands pop out at me when spinal tap is mentioned <laughs> uh, not not necessarily their their musical prowess but just their uh their delivery kind of <laughs> <laughs> but uh as far as like bands that i i mean one of the coolest things what was that band that played i i just came in when you guys were talking about second stage. I heard Bob talking about some second stage bands. I know it was the first year we did Legions. Bob, oh, band. was it Carriage with all the all the props? Yes, the, they 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 bought they they built these coffins like you could tell they were homemade coffins, and they put them all over the stage in the joint. And I was just so impressed by man, they had this little tiny stage, and they found a way to to really make it a show, which was so cool. So, yes, yeah. I was telling them earlier how we always talk about like. You want to have a good show, but like you want to have a great live performance through the whole show to believe all like you know, almost blown away. Like I couldn't believe how fun it was seeing all these great bands live and not just like one band, one band, one band, one band over again. You know, each show right. should be you know, you, you always want to have a good performance for every band. Yeah, and variety <laughs> is really important. You know, Bob has been very careful about making sure we don't repeat ourselves too much, which I think is very important and valuable and helps the helps the fest stay fresh you know you got to always keep bringing in bands that you haven't had before and we've we've tried really hard to do that even in you know this year where we had so many different cancellations and stuff we still came up with a, a pretty cool lineup i think compared like, yeah when you think of the fact that we lost pretty much all our headliners right bob yeah. at one point or another but yeah yeah this, this is our first year with one re the first repeat ever in our fest with uh Brooke's helm right yep are there any bands, dream bands, that you want to get to play in future editions? Well, I know Fifth, Fifth Angel was one of them. Um, yeah. Uh, but especially for, for me, I too. Don't, I'm speaking for Bob even more than me, I know how excited Bob was about Fifth Angel. But we're not giving up hope on that. Hopefully we can make it happen in a in a future year. Uh, but that that Fifth Angel, for sure, I think would have been would have been a super cool thing. Okay. Yeah, sure for me, I know, uh, yeah, I'd love to bring, you know, some more 80s bands. I hate to give names because then people go, oh, I'm going to book them. So it's kind of harder. But yeah, like Fifth Angel and Vane were my two, like, <clears throat> bucket list bands because I always wanted to have, when Chain and I started through this year, I was like, man, I want to mix some more hard rock into this, you know, because I've seen, you know, back in the 80s, people hated the hard rock. Either you're into thrash and heavy metal or you're into the hard rock. Yeah, you but now be, it seems you everybody's more open-minded, so we always tried to add a hard rock band in this, but never worked out. And then we had Vane, and we we're all like, "Oh my God, it's going to work!" Yeah, and... yeah. <laughs> well, we had some other hard rock bands uh, over the years too that unfortunately 
didn't happen. So we're still barking up that tree. Yeah, we had hoping. remember we had we, actually, we had rough cut book, rough and cut, I was actually yeah. going to announce. I was going to announce it. Literally, it was like I had the announcement. I was typing up, and then Shane message me saying, "Don't post it. Hold on." And then they canceled within like three they minutes. They had a, they actually had a legitimate excuse. The band was yeah. pretty much done. <laughs> and actually, and actually, they broke up. And they broke into two bands now. So now yeah. it's like, so yeah. That would have been our first official like '80s hard rock band, you know. Yeah, that would have been program. that would have been cool for sure. Was there ever a band that proved to be a complete surprise? The band that just kind of exploded out of nowhere. Um, oh, out of popularity wise, or just like? Uh, what about I would, I would say, um, Eternal Champion. Um, I don't think out of nowhere, but they, I would say they. Uh, what year did they play, Bob? Like 2019. I would say that by the time we booked them and the time we play, they played, they were a much bigger band than by the time Bob booked them. Yeah, because um, we, it, I, we, I first got them in 2014 at Ragnarokker for the small stage. My friend out here in Chicago did their cassette tape, and you no, know, everyone laughed at us. I went, "Have heard of these guys? The tape is too raw." And then yeah. when they played the joint stage. You couldn't walk in that room; it was so packed. And yeah, then, and then and then they're like even bigger, yeah. Yeah, um, then I think for me, Solicitor also is that way too. We got them yeah. on their second or third show only, and now they're like playing everywhere. They get really hard. And Amy's great; she's always been the backbone to the fest with us. You know, always they're supporting yeah, her playing she's somehow. Number one supporter always. Um, not come out of nowhere, but surprising for me. I was really surprised how good diamond head was yeah Uh, that new singer they have is just awesome and i really hadn't listened to the recent records until now like i i I went and checked out that latest record after i saw them live but that singer kills it the band is really really tight i you know it's not that i thought they were going to be bad but i was like holy shit they just sound top notch when, when they played that was really cool yeah definitely it's even like yeah phantom i thought too is that way that you know it sounded really good live and stuff and everyone to stop and look yeah it's weird everybody has it's like i think everyone has their own like mindset of what is great and stuff and what works but yeah we've been real lucky with a lot of surprises i mean every show i always walk away blown away by a few bands like i didn't think we're gonna be great or something and then they were like oh my god that was amazing yeah yeah for sure finally uh if there are bands who would love to play your festival and possibly are watching us right now um, how would they get in touch with you? Start with Bob. Uh, the, uh, the, basically, the Facebook page. I get hit up every day by at least two or three bands. Uh, and actually, what worked out to our benefit was when Fifth Angel dropped, Shane and I hit up like all these potential headliners, and all of them were busy because it was you know a month notice. A lot of these bands weren't ready, but there's like three or four headliner and co-headliner bands already like wanted to play next year if we do a sh- do the show yeah and i actually had one of the band's managers actually just messaged me the other day i'll tell you I'll, I'll offline the channel to play about it. yeah they were already putting in like you know wanted to play the show wanted details and stuff so i mean yeah the best way to hit us up is hit us on the fest page or my personal page if people know me and stuff and it's hard if we have like you know 20, 23 slots. So people hit a lot of people hit, hit me up saying, "Oh, can I give you a press kit? Can I give this?" Or basically, we book off of you know if the band if people want to see the band, if there's a buzz or you fit the style. I get a lot of black metal bands and death metal and grindcore bands, and we try to stick more with like traditional metal, classic metal, doom, power metal, and stuff more. This is our first year doing a black metal band, which actually worked out good with uh, Necrofire because Valkyrie dropped. And then that same day, they hit us up who were on tour. So we helped them out with the show. So it works out perfect. But yeah, it's, yeah, if, you want to, if bands want to hit us up, you know, best way to do it is just get a hold of us on the fest page and stuff. I mean, I said I have this notebook. I got right here the trusty Legions of the Metal notebook with all the, all the bands listed for, you know, Years to come, all in there. How old school is that? That's perfect, right? Perfect. Yeah, I, I have you know all my ideas in there and stuff, and reunions that when we talked about happening. Yeah, because we even had a really cool reunion set for this 
well, it would have been on this year, but they didn't want to do it. They weren't officially ready yet. They didn't think they were good enough, but I'm going to bug them again for next year, and hopefully they'll do it. It's a band that no one's seen live in a long time, and it'd be really cool. Finally, and, finally, oh, second finally. Sure. What do you get out of this? What's the best thing about this festival for both of you? Jane, you can go first. It's just so unique. It's, um, you know, it's, a, it's an event unlike anything I do throughout the rest of the year. I love working with Bob and, you know, becoming friends with him over the past five years or so has been great. Meeting so many new people and just, you know, really, we really spent a lot of time curating the lineup and making sure that, you know, we're, and like Bob said, we only have like 20 something slots over two days on two stages. We're really about, you know, quality over quantity. So just, it's really enjoying to kind of, enjoyable just to kind of put that together and just make sure that, you know, we present something that everybody's <laughs> going to love. And it's just like a big reunion with people every year too, which is great. You see a lot of the same people that come from out of town and you always meet some new people every year. So it's just a really, you know, it's just a rewarding experience to have something unique um, that you can continue to grow year in and year out. Yeah, for me, as I say, I love working with Shane and all the, you know, I learned so much from him the past couple of years about just how the business side works. It isn't from coming from a fan. I was, I have no history of doing shows or the industry itself or anything. I was just a fan who kind of fell into this. So for me, it's always kind of like, once in a while I'll sit back and I'm like, oh my God, it's like, I've been given like this gift to kind of like book a dream show of a year of bands that I like or bands I want to see, you know, help out and stuff. And so it's kind of a weird thing to sit here and be like, I'm talking to these bands or I've had like, you know, picking up bands at the airport or having my house hanging out here and sitting there going like, I have like guys from Liege Lord at my house sitting here and I'm like, wow, it's like weird to turn around or being like these guys that are legendary sitting in your living room or going to dinner and stuff. So it's kind of a weird experience to, it, it, you know, I, I have a similar story with Liege Lord too, because you know, I grew up much more of a thrash kid and Leech Lord was so cool for me because, um, oh, there, Joe is in this band and he was in Annihilator and Overkill, you know, and Van, Van from Nevermore was playing drums and Nevermore was one of my favorite bands of all time. So like, I like Leech Lord too, but I was just kind of like, wow, these guys are like, I re really big part of my upbringing listening to the other bands they were in. So that was kind of a neat full circle thing for me. Yeah, it's, a, it's a definitely a cool thing with that. Yeah, that's the thing for me. It's always just, I'm always amazed and blessed every year we get to do this. I'm like, you know, as much work as it is, everyone's like, oh, do you ever hate it? I'm like, no, never. Even like when these people in a band just drop and bad things happened, it's always like something cool comes from it at least to go on and stuff. There's always, you know, it's always exciting every day. There's never a dull moment. Yeah, there's, there's some things that in this business, just like any job that I don't enjoy very much, but Legions is never in that category for sure yeah I was, I was talking about how you know it's a some of the headaches are just dealing with like the flights and the budget side and the business side but yeah it's but overall it's always a pleasant experience even people we've had issues with or you know you think it's gonna be trouble and then day of the show when they come and you meet them in person it's like oh you know there you go oh yeah and there's, people, there's people we've become friends with now like you know and they're friends now that fans that we booked or you know so it's kind of nice. Yeah, Bob and Betsy Weiss are great friends because of Legions, right, Bob? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I go to LA, we always go to dinner every year and hang out there. This is friends, and we don't even talk music. We hang out and talk about just life and movies and stuff. So it's kind of a weird, weird full circle of things how it works out. Yeah, it's very cool. Great. Uh, well, Bob and Shane, thank you for speaking to me about the festival, and and good luck with everything. Thank you, yeah. Mark. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, we'll see you there hopefully. Yes. See you guys. Take care. Cool. See you, Shane.